In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we ask you to be with us this morning as we open our hearts to the Word. For the Word is your revelation. It is your presence among us. And so we ask that we may be present to this, this Word, and respond to it with generous hearts. We thank you for continuing to reveal yourself to us in our lives. And we thank you for the faith that we share. And we ask that you bless our time together today so that we may come to a, this deeper love for you and a deeper understanding of Jesus, our Lord. We ask this through Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Why are you standing all around? Sit down. <laughs> Let's see, we're talking about the Christmas story today, I think. Yeah, let's start with Jingle Bells, because that's a good... Well, isn't that lovely? Thank you for sharing that with us today. Yeah, thank you. We're in chapter 10 of Luke's Gospel. And we're at the end of chapter 10. Verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to him, listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve all alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Have you heard this story before? Yes. All right, good. Everyone loves to identify themselves as a Martha, but... Um, the point of the story is to I, uh, that both characters in this gospel are meant to be identified with. So what I want you to do at your table for a few minutes, and Michelle, you might have to move if you want to converse with anyone else. I will. <laughs> okay. Um, I want you to answer the question is, what does Jesus mean when he says, when he says, one thing is needful. Martha, Martha, you're anxious and worried about many things. One thing is needful, or you might have necessary, or required, or whatever. But you see that? Verse 42. One thing is needful. Okay, so take some time now and... Um, have a discussion at your table with the people with you about what, what could Jesus be meaning by that statement. Okay? Go! Thank you. 
referring, of course, to the number of dishes that she's bringing out. Yeah, that's the dinner. That's dinner on the table. That yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you need some more discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Spell it the same way. Yeah. Okay, if, if it's all right, let's, uh, let's move to the larger discussion. And anyone want to tell us what, what Jesus means by, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and worried about many things. Only one thing is necessary. What is that? The one thing is the relationship with God. Oh, the 
And so you think that Martha doesn't have a relationship? Well, I think Martha does. I think there are different ways to have relationships. Okay. All right. All right. Who else has uh, wants to add to the discussion here? Listening, okay. Maybe attendance, listening, kind of, you know, kind of geared toward um, focus on Jesus. What is Martha, what? I said, no, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Is there anything wrong with multitasking? Yeah, I, yes. Yes? Yeah, especially when you're in front of the Lord. Oh, okay. So in front of the Lord, we shouldn't be multitasking. Are we ever not in front of the Lord? No. no. All right. Okay. But I mean, if, not, if it's a... Okay, yeah, in front of the Lord, specifically in front of the Lord, like in church, um, or, you know, if the Lord comes back, Okay. On my knees, on my face. Okay. Well, I think like Bart said, you know, different people have different viewpoints on what is serving someone. Uh, you know, if a famous person comes to your house, you may say, oh, boy, this person has a lot to share, and I want to hear and be in their presence. But at the same time, you might say, oh, I need to get them food, and I need to make them comfortable. And yeah. Them. Mm -hmm. So it, it just depends on what your personal viewpoint is. I mean, we all meet those people who, there, there's a lady I was working with last night who, she wants to do everything for so is that wrong? No. So is Mar Martha's not wrong then? I don't think she's wrong. She's not wrong. It's just a different moment where she said. Even though Jesus says, Martha, Martha, come on, girl. Well, you know, you do your thing, Mary's doing her thing. She does, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. Well, you said Mary chose the better part. Yeah? And that better part is that she's sitting at the feet of Jesus as a woman which was unusual uh, to take the position of a disciple. Okay. So she is... And I believe that's what Jesus was defining as a, the better part. But see, my Bible says, Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her, which to me says, you know, don't make her get up and help you because she's she has chosen the way that she wants to serve. But, but you could continue serving. Well, I, it doesn't say in the Bible. <laughs> I don't think Jesus was condemning Martha. No, okay. So what specifically shows his concern? What, I'm asking a question, what, per, what specifically shows that he's concerned about women? Keep serving, lady. got a, a thought. Bob. If Martha was really listening, she'd stop serving and sit with Mary. And okay. Then see later what the consequences were for the group. Okay. So Jesus is not pleased with Mary, uh, with Martha. He would rather have her at his feet. I think he's telling her something about her personality, that she's anxious and worried about many things. It just happens that right now it's about serving. But maybe in the context of her life, there's other things. Like she's also 
So is that is that a criticism? Is Jesus criticizing her for being overly I mean, an distracted? And then yes, and it's an analysis and a method of is being distracted a good thing? <laughs> Depend what you're distracted from. Okay. If it's me, for instance. Exactly. <laughs> you know, the way I look at this is Martha is like all of us. Life is so busy, there's so many things in your life, and it's so easy to get involved and do so much that you don't even think about that. And that's one thing that I like about the kind of church that you're part of in that, and it works at least once a week you're doing something about God. Yeah. And so, you know, God, Jesus is saying, hey, you're more than just doing stuff. Okay. All right. That's good. So is Jesus challenging her because she's worried about worldly things? Or is he accepting her service and saying, well, that's fine. That's good. That's which? Okay. All right. That's good. That's good. What? Help her see more than. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not condemning you, but there is a greater reality that you might want to attend to, and that listening or that um, you know attending to is actually. In, a, in an array of goods, what comes first? Not service, but attention to the Lord. What does this story, now, if I told you that this story is the second story now in a sequence that focuses on discipleship. We heard the first story last Sunday, it was the Good, uh, the good Samaritan, and now we hear this story, which follows immediately after the story of the Good Samaritan. Can you see a connection between those two stories in terms of what it's helping us to understand about discipleship? Staying present. Staying pre fill it out for me. Yeah, but here's this guy who's who's uh, he's he's intent on what he's doing, and he sees a guy in the ditch, and no longer is he, you know, he's not distracted by doing stuff. He goes deliberately and does stuff. Intent on doing the right thing. Okay, is Martha not intent at doing the right thing? She wasn't aware that she there's something she could have been doing which is better, and and she and the Lord didn't slam her. He just said, you know, really, you don't need. Okay. Okay. All right. Anyone else? A thought? Yeah. Maybe it's deciding who's in me. Like the Samaritan, he determined that the person needed him. And in this, Jesus says, Martha, you're in me. Mary's here. Okay, but Martha's attending to the needs. The right. needs are hospitality. So she has a, a, a greater need to be present to the Lord. I think. Okay. One of the things that we can think about is, what is the motive for Martha to be so caught up in things that are overwhelming her and causing her to be resentful? She's resentful. She's not just 
doing a, a lovely job of service and, and just kind of quietly sucking it up and saying, Lord, this is all for you, and I hope my sister can enjoy your conversation with her, and I'll continue to work in the kitchen and make sure we have a, a wonderful... No, she's not that way. She's, Lord, aren't you concerned that I have to be left with all the work? Tell her to help me. I just couldn't find the table. <laughs> um, where was I? You're in the church. I don't know why I even look in your direction. Um, yeah, let me, well, I can, st I can stay here. Um, so we were talking about Martha and her attitude. But that's, but here's the problem with that. That, that's not indicated in the story. <laughs> yeah, 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 it does. But it, then it says, and a woman named Martha had Jesus come to her house. It doesn't say he had the whole, on, she had the whole entourage in, which would have been 72 plus the 12. <laughs> so we're looking at 84 plus Jesus, and maybe Mary was there. So now we're looking at 85 people. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Martha, what a look, Leroy, did you have a? <laughs> it's a good thing we have Sabina here. I know, I'm Martha. I am a Martha. I worry about the worldly things. Yeah, you do. So they don't mop in Germany. I said, well, now how are you going to know we, to do this? We mop a lot better than the Americans. <laughs> well, you're managing it, so you can. I know. <laughs> Looks like that mop could use a good cleaning. That's how they look out there. I'll get it. You go ahead and take five. All right. And I'm, I won't interrupt Father. <laughs> All right. So we've got, we've got an issue in terms of um, not just the fact that Martha is serving, but there's also her words, which indicate uh, something that is not correct in the Lord's mind. But you're right; the Lord doesn't castigate her; He doesn't negatively, you know, condemn her. He just tells her gently, which I which I love. It's gently. It's like Martha, Martha. Can you can see Him smiling at her? You know, you're worried and distracted about many things. There's only one thing necessary. Okay, so it's really important. That's why I said let's compare this to the story of the Good Samaritan. Because in the story of the Good Samaritan, the doer gets praised. Not the ones who think kind thoughts. Oh, there's a poor man in the ditch. Oh, hope somebody takes care of him. I'll pray. 
No, it's the doer who goes and stops whatever else he's doing to make sure that this man is cared for. And this is the one that Jesus praises. And so immediately following that, there is the story of a doer. You know, Martha is the doer. She is the disciple. She is the faithful disciple who is responding to the, to the story of the Good Samaritan. I mean, we don't know that she heard the story of the Good Samaritan, but she's living out her life in a, in a way of service. And so we have to understand that both of these individuals, Mary and Martha, are regarded as important disciples in following the Lord. Okay? So they're not, it's not like, well, Mary's chosen the better por portion and I'm, I'm, you know, more, uh, I, she's more faithful to me. It's like, um, no, you're both being faithful to me in terms of your responsibilities. But if we were to, in the end, evaluate what response one makes to the Lord present in their midst is, well, maybe you should slow down and pay attention to what the Lord has to say. So it's gentle, it's chiding, it's, it's um, kind of setting some priorities, okay? So that's why I wanted to connect it with the, the, the Good Samaritan. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. That's a good reminder. Let's go deeper into the story and let me point out a few things for you, okay? So we're looking at the verse 38. They went on their way. He entered a village and a woman named Martha. When, when, um, when Luke indicates that it's a they, he kind of, in, kind of in the back of his mind, he has the church. It's the church. It's the assembly of the disciples that are on their way, and Jesus is the Lord in their midst of them. So we are to understand that this is, who, who said, oh, Bonnie said, it's not a private encounter. It's a public event that the church needs to pay attention to and that the disciples need to pay attention to because it's part of their training. Notice that it's a woman named Martha and the story is a, therefore about Martha and it's not about Martha and Mary. Even though Mary gets referred to in the story, it's about Jesus' relationship to this woman Martha and what he expects of her and what he can um, draw out from her. We notice that she had a sister, Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet. Now, just to remember that Martha and Mary only appear in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, they have a brother What's his name? Lazarus. Lazarus. Okay, so they have a brother named Lazarus, and then John develops a story about Lazarus' death and the two women who are, in John's gospel, in character. They become the same characters that we see in this story, where... Mary says, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, he'll do for you. And he says to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. She says, I know he'll rise again on, in the resurrection on the last day. And Mary comes to the Lord and says, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would not have died. And she just weeps at his feet. So she's present. Martha is take charge. Jesus says, show me where he's buried. Martha says, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not going out there. You know, he's been dead four days now. Surely there's going to be a stench. She's the take charge person. Lovely that there's this continuity, even though these are two different gospels and two different gospel stories. 
Um, Mary and Martha also appear at the point in John's Gospel right before the Passion begins for Jesus goes to the house of Martha and Mary and Bethany and has his feet anointed by Mary and that's in John's Gospel so um, we have different stories of anointings we have the head being anointed of Jesus we have the feet being anointed or wept over with tears and those appear in the gospel but in John's gospel we have clearly it is Mary of Bethany who is the one who washes the Lord's feet with her tears okay and anoints them so um, just to kind of help you understand who these characters are all right so looking back then um, Sitting at the Lord's feet, as Bill pointed out, is the position of a disciple. Okay, so the, the reminder about the, the, if you can image the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus do? He gathers his disciples at the top of this mountain and he sits down and he teaches them. Now, you have to imagine that they have all placed themselves on the ground below him so that they're physically below him as he teaches and so the same is true with Jesus being seated and teaching he is in the position of the rabbi the teacher the one who instructs his disciples so Mary at his feet um, Lord do you not care that my sister has left tell her to help me she tells Jesus what to do <laughs> Might be a little bit of chutzpah there, you know? But she's a Jewish woman, so. All right, um, tell her to help me. The Lord answered her. So one of the things that you might think about is that Mar Martha is the head of the household, okay? We hear that it's Martha's house. Martha has the responsibility as the head of the household to provide hospitality. So she's doing what she's supposed to do. She's being faithful, a faithful disciple. But now Jesus is going to take over being head of the household. And he's going to tell Martha, settle down, honey. Or, you know, this is, this is the way we're going to move forward. So he takes the role of authority in the house here and that's kind of representative of the church. We always have to remember that we, we present ourselves to the Lord who helps us to determine what needs to be done. I don't want to get off track, but that story of Martha here, Jesus spoke sternly to her. And at the resurrection or at the bring back to life Lazarus, he became very upset. Mm -hmm. because Martha had said, Lord, there'll be a major stench. Mm -hmm. He's been dead for four days. Yeah. And he was very upset that they had yet been able to understand who he was and who, and, and right. he not listen to him. Martha would lead the way in that again. Right. And, uh, didn't and I just say, didn't I just say that? What to do. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's what I, I wanted to make sure that you understood about that story as well. She takes charge. Okay, um, when Jesus repeats a name like Martha, Martha, we're supposed to understand that this is a very important announcement, okay? It's just like amen, amen, okay? Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. She's the good Samaritan. She, of course, is worried and, and but, what happens when service is contaminated by self-pity and resentment? It no longer has any validity. It's done out of pride, you know. See what a good servant I am. Now, I'm resentful of those who haven't stepped up to do their responsibility or their, their duties. And that isn't good. So Mary then is defended by Jesus in terms of her practice. And um, 
the interesting, one of the interesting words, and in, Michelle, you have it in your Bible, I have it in mine, the good portion, and some of you have, uh, Mary has chosen the better part. Better part? Okay. So the original Greek suggests that it's almost like a meal where you get a portion of grits. You know, here's your portion. That's the word that's being used here. She's chosen the better portion. She's chosen the vegetables rather than the starch. But a, a full meal includes all of it. Uh, uh, so it's not, you can't do that service. You must simply attend to me. It's like, well, that service is really important, as we talked about in the Good Samaritan story. Service is essential. But it always has to take, um, take a back seat to the, the need simply to be attentive to how the Lord is speaking. Otherwise, it ends up in resentment and hurt feelings and self-pity and pride and everything else. So if you're not doing it out of the love of the Lord, which you first encountered by being with him, and you're just going off and serving, you're going to ultimately fail in your response to what the Lord now, this is not permission not to serve. This is just a reminder of its priority. Okay, any thoughts, any questions you want to further on? Any further discussion on this? It's about selfless service, not being begrudging. Right, right, exactly. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very clear. Very clear. Okay, let's take a break now, and uh, then we'll go into the Genesis story. Put these two parables back to back, which I had never thought about. Could they be illustrative, practical way of the meaning of the only commandment there is? Love the Lord your God would all they can be, but there's going to be a third passage now that, that also deals with. The first one is about service of neighbor. The second one is about service of Christ. The third one is service of God. So you can see those three in a row. Good. Yeah. I'm a little bit clumsy. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get you one of those sippy cups. Next time. <laughs> it's one that the lid won't fly off of. That's right. Yeah, good, good. We'll That's what I want. Off to those yeah, that yeah. Good, <laughs> good. That'll work. I think they did, yes. Yeah. They told me they were going to. Yeah, I got an email that I had to pay that much for you then. And so I sent it back. I thought I paid it already. Yeah. She said they charged me. Uh, yeah. I think it's because um, the cost of the flights have all gone oh, up gosh, radically. Yeah. I'm going to fly to Portland at the beginning of the month. And yeah. it's going to be $1,200. Oh, yeah. It was, Something to share. It was, it was $1,000 for me to fly to Florida in May. Thousand dollars. You can mention that we've been out of town a whole bunch, but we have. Just I know. Been, where <laughs> have you been? Everywhere. And, and after today, we won't be back for till first of September. Oh, for goodness' <laughs> sake! You might as well join another parish. We're, we're, we're trying to ignore you. <laughs> it's just been crazy. So far. Yeah. So anyway, we we love coming here. It's just we just haven't been around. Ah, so good to have you. I want to let you know. Through my mind, as if Luke said the next sentence 
after what Jesus said here, if he said the next thing Jesus said, it might have been, oh, by the way, what's for dinner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be good. Even though it's fat. Any pineapple over there? Any blueberries? No. Blackberries. They are when they are ripe. When they're, I have I have plant blackberry plants in my yard. And um, when they when they finally turn black and they're no longer shiny, that's when they're best. Yeah. Okay. All right, back to work, everyone. We're in the book of Genesis. Genesis, the first five, uh, the first 11 books of the book of Genesis are sort of their own document and they're about the origin of the world and the origin of certain features of the world, origin of the human race, the origin of different aspects of, you know, like the origin of murder, the origin of the languages, the origin of this, the origin of that. So that first 11 books, or first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis have their own kind of uh, contained information. In chapter 12, we begin the story of Abraham, okay? And chapter 12, then, is considered to be sort of the beginning of this book outside of those first 11 chapters because then the story of Abraham unfolds with his son and with his grandson and with the generations that follow. So the beginning of the book that really um, that starts at chapter 12 tells us who Abraham is and how he got established as the father of many nations. So Abraham is going to inherit the, the, um, the covenant. God is going to make the covenant with Abraham and that, Abra that covenant is going to persist through the ages um, as the covenant God that, that God made with his people. That covenant consists of, I'm going to give you descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and the shore on the sea, and I'm going to give you land, and that land is your posterity, and you're going to, you and your people will thrive on that land. The original promise of land was from the Euphrates River to the Nile, okay? So it's a much bigger piece of property than they ended up with or that they're occupying today, okay? It's a much bigger piece of property, but in the end, they settled in that narrow strip of land um, that's on the coast of the Mediterranean, the east coast of the Mediterranean, okay? So, um, and then the progeny, 
um, of course, we understand that all children of the earth are children of Abraham. Now, so chapters 12 and 13 are going to set us up for that. Chapters 14 through 17 are about exploits as Abraham is living in the land of Canaan. Okay? In, eight, in 18, we go back to the original story. So if you would look at chapter 13 as we begin this. Genesis, Genesis chapter 13. And I want you to look at the end of the chapter. Get up, a seven, verse 17. Okay, the end of the chapter 13, verse 17. Get up and walk through the land across its length and breadth, for I give it to you. Abram moved his tents and went on to settle near the oak of Mamre, which is at Hebron. There he built an altar to the Lord. The terebinth of Mamre is the same thing as the oak uh, of Mamre. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shady covering. A terebinth is a shady covering caused by tree or a, a number of trees. Okay? So that, that's what a terebinth is, if you have terebinth in your Bible. Okay? But it's the idea that there is this great solemn oak that probably had ancient... Uh, cultic character to it. It was probably part of ancient people's religious rites or something like that. So Abraham takes it for himself and he becomes the resident underneath its branches. Now, if you go from the end of 13 to the beginning of 18, you'll see that these are connected. The Lord appeared to Moses by the oak of Mamre. Do you have that? Okay. Abraham. Yeah, I meant Abraham. Why are why are you bringing Moses into this conversation? <laughs> Moses is still in Moses Yeah. <laughs> Some guy with a beard. Yeah. Some old guy with a beard. All right. So, that's why I wanted to kind of show you that these pieces are, you know, are not seamlessly woven together. The pieces that make up the book of Genesis, the text from the Yahwistic tradition, the text from the priestly tradition, the text from the Elohist tradition, the text from the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic tradition, four strands woven together in the stories that we encounter in the first few books of the Bible. Four different strands representing different periods and different styles of writing. The Yahwistic is more concerned about presenting God in human form. God is like a man, so God is anthropomorphic, we say. He has the characteristics of a guy, you know, so he's just like us in a certain sense. The priestly tradition emphasizes worship and the acts of worship that are described in those books are normally coming from that tradition. The Elohist tradition is an ancient Canaanite version of God where God is called not Yahweh but El, E-L. And so we get this E-L, Elohistic tradition where God is addressed as a Canaanite God, El. And then finally, the Deuteronomic tradition, which probably is an addition of the, the story with the addition of the Deuteronomic writings that occurred in the 8th century. So a much newer branch of writings that have been incorporated into the original book of Genesis. Okay? So just want to so 14 chapters 14 to 17 are a different tradition than chapters 12, 13 and 18. Okay? 
So 12, 13, 18, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you get a sense of the peace togetherness of the way the Old Testament is written. Okay? Good? Understandable? All right. Um, so let's look at the story. Chapter 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak of Mamre as he sat in the entrance of his tent. Now, by the way, between 13 and 18, between those two chapters, Moses has been circumcised and renamed. So in chapter 13, he's called Abram. In chapter 18, he's called Abraham, because that's his new name. And the Abraham, instead of Abram, means, okay, so Abram means father of the nations. Abraham means father of many nations. Okay? So they're almost the same, but adding that little H-A, you know, makes a difference in terms of the name. Okay, so Abraham is sitting by the oak of Mamre. Uh, he sat in the entrance of his tent. The day was growing hot. Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them. Now, if they're standing near him, why does he have to run, <laughs> run to greet them? All right. He bowing to the ground, he said, Sir, notice that the three have become now one. Sir. What? Why is the reading doing that? We're going to go back to two and then three again. All right. Think about that. Sir, if it had pleased you, do not go past your servant. Let some water be brought that you may bathe your feet and then rest under the tree. Now that you have come to your servant, let me bring you a little food that you may refresh yourself and afterward you may go on your way. Very well, they said, do as you have said. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three measures of bran flour. Or you have, what do you have, barley? Fine flour. Shea's? Shea's. Okay. Um, Sayas. It's yeah, called yeah. Sayas. Quick three Sayas of bran flour or fine flour. Knead it and make. Anyone make ever make bread out of bran? It's not a good bread. I don't know where the, why the bran flour is fine flour, but it's not a very good bread. All right, um, then he got some curds. Well, he ran to the herd, picked out a tender choice calf, gave it to a servant who quickly prepared it. How long does it take to cook a calf? A good, good half a day anyway. Nobody's in a hurry in those days. It's just too hot. Yeah, all right. Um, then he got some curds and milk, as well as the calf that had been prepared, and set these before them, waiting on them under the tree while they ate. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There, in the tent, he replied. One of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will then have a son. And of course, Sarah's listening and she laughs. And she laughs because she's too old to have a son. And apparently, they're not having sex with each other either. Um, so she's a little bit kind of amazed at what's, what's unfolding there. Um, OK, what do we want to understand? What do we want to glean from this story? First of all, there's the aspect of hospitality. So I've talked about it before, but you know, our, our understanding of hospitality is quite different than the ancient world, especially the ancient desert world, where hospitality was a matter of life and death, not just convenience 
or here we go, it's just some nice people, but rather the, the, the need to extend to travelers um, a gracious outpouring of your resources for their well-being is tied in with their actual survival in a climate, in a hostile environment that would cost them their lives if they couldn't depend upon this kind of hospitality. So it was incumbent upon the adult or the patriarchal male in any, in any particular household or series of households to present to those who are arriving, even though they're absolutely strange, the opportunity for refreshment, hospitality, a place to stay, and a play and opportunity to eat. So it's a sacred duty tied in with life and death. And that's what, what we have to understand in, in this culture. In our culture where we offer hospitality, life and death are not a part of the equation, you know? But in this culture where water, food were scarce in the desert world, it was absolutely necessary to provide. And so there is this sense of opportunity to make a difference to somebody. And you get that sense with Abraham. Abraham runs out. He's excited. Please, sir, because the stranger blesses the household and the person of Abraham by his sharing in that food. It, 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 it's, you know, it's like, wow, are we ever privileged to have you share food with us, you know? Nobody's ever said that to me. Yeah, they have. <laughs> Actually, they have. People have said that to me. So, um, yeah. So, but the idea is that this is a blessing now that the travelers then impart on the host. And so we see that enacted in this story. Your wife, next year when I return to you, will have a son. There's the blessing, okay? I, Abraham, have gone out of my way to be hospitable to you, to bring you out of the desert, to sit you under the tree, to give you milk, to give you a, a, a calf, to, to provide you with bread, everything that you needed for your sustenance, sustenance and survival, and in turn, you offer me your blessing. Now, this is not the first time that Abraham is promised a son, okay? God has promised him a son and he has already laughed at that and will you know kind of share in the mirth of his wife Sarah but um, and hence the name of the child is Itzhak. Itzhak means laughter okay so that's Isaac to us okay all right remember that no, but I didn't have what happens to Isaac Abraham says, oh, I'm done with you, kid. Let's go to the altar. <laughs> Pulls out a knife to kill him, and then what happens? The angel says, the angel says stop. <laughs> Let's talk about the three visitors. Did you have a comment? No, relating to the three visitors, because in my mind, when you're reading it, you go back and forth, yeah. referring to one person, referring to three. Yeah. And can you guess what that might be about? No, I know. They, that's typical for us as Christians to slam the, slap the Trinity on those three figures. But there, there is nothing to suggest that that's the case. Um, but the, the, the wavering of, well, how many are there? And who is he talking to? And what's going on here is the idea that this is God. Not God the Trinity but that somehow God in this manifestation between three and one and all this kind of stuff and the, the instability of it all is to represent, well, this is God who nobody knows and nobody can know. And he is one, he might be three, he might be two. I mean, this kind of adds an air of mystery to the whole encounter. But the concept of the Trinity is not yet developed. It's not developed until we get into the New Testament. So it really isn't 
although many Christian artists and writers and everything have presumed that we're seeing a glimpse of the Trinity in this story. But there's nothing in the story to indicate that that's the case. Well, why didn't the scripture say two rather than three? I, th I think that three has to be somewhat consequential. Or, or why, why was it three? In the I don't know. Yeah, yeah, could have been, could have been, could have been, Mike, sorry, I don't know everything. Okay, so the meal, extravagant, okay, just, just beyond, beyond your mindset, I mean, who's going to kill a cow and give it to somebody to eat, you know, it's not normal, um, so we're to understand from the story that Abraham, the character of Abraham is sort of portrayed. He's a generous and attentive sheik. Okay, we've got to remember that Abraham is a very, very wealthy man. In the, and he's, he's traveling with his entourage, which includes probably, you know, um, hundreds, hundreds of people who are somehow connected to him and his family. And their livestock. And their livestock and, you know, everything else. And they're trying to find a place to dwell. And they will end up going down to Egypt. Remember that story where Moses presents Sarah as his uh, sister? Um, rather because he didn't want Pharaoh to kill him and you know this regard but um, so they go down to Egypt and then they end up migrating back north to the land of Canaan and the Hebron Hebron and the Oak of Mamre become kind of central to the um, identity of the Jewish people descended from Abraham okay all right let's take a look at, at um, Whatever. <laughs> Colossians. Still in chapter one. Okay. You know where Colossian where Colossus is? I showed you last week on the map. It's in Turkey. Yeah, it's in Turkey. Yeah. Um, it's further west than Syria. So Syria is like, Syria is in this little cusp right here. So Syria comes in here, and Turkey comes in here. So Antioch has, Antioch, would you, can you see that? Okay. A little, uh, there's a city here called Antioch, and it, today this city is called Ant Antakya or something like that. Antakya, and it is a very important city. And over the years, it has belonged to Turkey, Syria, Turkey, Syria, Turkey, and back and forth. And so, I think today it belongs to Turkey. Um, all right, we're in Colossians. We just had the Christ hymn last week where uh, Paul has adopted a, a, a hymn that was used probably in service, in ritual, in liturgy, um, maybe baptism or something like that. He has put it into the text to help this image of Christ become like the central image in which we all are attached to so that the the, the context is there's some division going on in the community of the Colossians. How do I get them back in the same fold? I present them Jesus Christ and I remind them of Jesus Christ as the one we have our faith in. And therefore, that consolidation that brings us all together again in the same belief 
will finally get us to the point where we can talk with each other and work out our problems and things like that. So that little uh, conversation continues. Um, uh, look at verse 21. And you who once were estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled. So this idea that we're bringing it all together in Christ Jesus. We're at verse 24. Now, Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings <clears throat> for your sake. And in my flesh, in my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. Okay, now, this is a kind of a, a challenging uh, verse because Christ's sufferings and affliction were perfect. They didn't come up short, in other words. They didn't, there weren't some who were sort of left out and Jesus said, now I want my disciples to suffer so that those souls who were, I, I couldn't accommodate can now be accommodated by your suffering. Uh-uh, that's not the point. The point is that Jesus suffered and died for everyone, and this was adequate. But what Paul is suggesting is that is his own sufferings, his own difficulties, challenges, his being hurt, his being almost martyred, his being, you know, kind of under siege and, and in prison and all that kind of stuff is a part of that suffering of Christ. And he does it for the sake of Christ so that he may be perfected. Because one of Paul's important points is that suffering perfects us. If we approach our suffering, our challenges, our difficulties, whatever suffering we face in life, if we approach them with, with the right disposition and the right understanding of God's providential care for us, those sufferings make us stronger and make us more responsive to the power of God's work in our lives. And that's the point that he wants to make. Suffering isn't to be avoided. Suffering is to be embraced as a way of participating in the suffering of Christ for the redemption and the well-being of all people. So we're only joining ourselves to Christ in our suffering. We're not doing something on our own. We're not suffering for you. I'm not suffering for you. Christ suffered and died for you. I don't have to do that. But what I'm doing is joining myself uh, you know, each Friday morning when I come here. I'm joining myself to the sufferings of Christ um, that have already been adequate. Okay, so I rejoice in my suffering. Suffering's a sign of faithfulness to the gospel. Why do you suffer more than you could accomplish? Why, why do you think your opinion matters? <laughs> you think hum suffering makes us humble? Of course it does. Yes, of course it does. You're right. Yeah. I just like to have fun with you. All right. So there is nothing truly lacking in Christ's affliction for, for you know, he suffered for the whole church. The, uh, I have become a minister, so Paul is recognizing himself as one who is called into service. That word minister is the word deacon. Okay? So it comes from this Greek concept of diakonos. I am here to serve you. Diakonos. I'm a servant, deacon. Uh, according to the divine office, that is, according to God's plan, unfolding plan, I'm doing this, I'm participating in this, because it's God's plan, which was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known so Paul is reminding them of his apostolic responsibilities. God has given me this grace and this understanding so that I can present to you and call you into this fellowship as well. So it's a real kind of testimony to his vocation as an apostle and as a preacher. Um, 
So, uh, finishing up, the mystery known for ages. Do you have mystery in verse 26? Yes, mystery hidden. hidden. But you have the mystery. Yes. The mystery is hidden. So, what is the mystery that was hidden? It's in the reading, by the way, just, just to kind of point you in the right direction. The mystery is Christ in you. Do you see that below? Yeah? You see it? If Lee can see it, everyone can see it, right? Here's the mystery. It is not that God is somewhere else, but that Christ is in you. And that Christ is in you, and this is the hope of Glory. This is the hope of our salvation right there. That this union that we have with Christ, which is the mystery that has been hidden for all ages, is now revealed. I, Paul, your preacher, have suffered to bring you this news so that you may share in this life that God has and Christ in you. He's dealing with Gentiles and Jews, but he's kind of, kind of putting them all together and helping them to understand that this preaching project that he's been involved in has been to include them in this concept, Christ in you. Christ in you. Not somewhere else. In you. Okay? All right. Um, him we proclaim... <coughs> warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ. And maturity in Christ is that we come, he says in the other, one of his other epistles, to attain the full stature or full maturity in Christ is the goal uh, that he's working at so that we become Christ in the world. Not just a person kind of doing what Jesus wanted us to do, but that we become actually, people identify, there's the work of Christ. That must be Christ. Okay? All right. I'm kind of done. Any questions? Any thoughts? This is really, really a great reading. And anyone being a lector this weekend? You think? Okay. You are? Okay, you got this reading? Thank you. Do a good job. Here's the mystery. Christ in you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.